Thank you again, and I uh, would like to follow with the next lecture after this great uh, uh, discussion by Dr. Faki, who, uh, if anything, set up the stage for more of details about checkpoint inhibitors. And this time, I'm going to be talking about uh, the checkpoint inhibitors as well as, of course, targeted therapies in regard to HCC. And these are my disclosures. And these are my contacts. And of course, please feel free to reach at any time and make sure you follow on the Twitter. So if anything about HCC, this is the right handle to follow. And of course, we start the story with the news that has been really uh, uh, very impactful. And we uh, heard about it almost a year ago. It was presented at ESMO Asia back in December last year. Uh, the Embraer 150 looking at atezolizumab plus bevacizumab and was compared to the stand of care sorafenib. As we can see here, there is a clearly a, a major advantage in regard to survival for the atezolizumab plus bevacizumab with the median not reached even by the time it was reported, while sorafenib 13.2. Of course, please note that, uh, as you can see at the x-axis, even at the time of reporting, there's only three patients left on the atezolizumab plus bevacizumab, which presumably, in other words, it's gonna be somewhere in the range of the 20 plus month. The progression-free survival, again, was also positive. And if anything, uh, we can see here that it was 6.8 months for the atezolizumab plus bevacizumab and 4.3 months for the sorafenib. I know there has been some of us who brought up the question, oh, we would have expected more. But to be fair, we really are unable to really how much kind of draw, how much this kind of you know, combination brought up in regard to the whole story of the different therapies that are available. But what is the contribution in regard to the different therapies that are available? By all means, it is impactful as we have seen with the survival data. Interestingly, the outcome, and this is very important for all of us, has been noted to be positive independent of age. This is one variable that we kind of, you know, take sometimes into perspective uh, among many others. And we can see here clearly that atezolizumab plus bevacizumab did favor an outcome uh, that majorly uh, was improved compared to sorafenib independent of age. One story, though, that uh, come into play is anti-drug antibody that, uh, as we can see over here from uh, work that was presented back in February this year in CCR, it shows clearly that uh, contrary to all other checkpoint inhibitors, atezolizumab can induce a potential 50% chance of anti-drug antibody among patients getting it. While this compares, as you can see, uh, drastically to a very minimal 1% to 2% in map, as an example. What does that mean? It implies that if the patient got the drug, i.e. atezolizumab, they have a 50-50 chance they will get an antibody to the drug, i.e. the drug will not work. It will be disrupted by the antibody and it will not work. Interestingly, the FDA came to uh, note this, and this was added in the package insert of atezolizumab for HCC. And we can see clearly here that for the whole study that I just showed you, the hazard ratio was 0 0.58. It improved markedly for the anti-drug antibody negative, i.e. those patients who did not get anti-drug antibody to 0 0.39. But on the other hand, for the anti-drug antibody positive patients, in other words, those patients who develop anti-drug antibody to the atezolizumab, the hazard ratio worsened to 0.93, i.e. almost telling us that atezolizumab plus bevacizumab is as good as sorafenib in that population. How to apply that? Not yet there, but nonetheless, it's something to think of. And of course, we should not really forget about the uh, tyrosine kinase inhibitors that have been really with us for a long while. This is sorafenib that was compared to, uh, uh, to the placebo and showed the improvement survival that remained with us for almost 12 years as the literally the sole uh, standard of care available for us. Afterwards came lymvatinib, and lymvatinib was looked at into a non-inferiority study versus sorafenib. I know some of us bring up a question as if like it's a uh, 
you know, shorter track to get on to get a positive study doing a non-inferiority. Not necessarily true, because number one, statistically are totally different between superiority and non-inferiority. And number two, I think I give credit here to the investigators led by Dr. Kudo, is that after all, the racetrack was already defined. This is how much a tyrosine can inhibitor can pull, 13 or about 13 months in survival. However, how much can every runner in a track field and in a uh, relay race into that racetrack, that's interesting. If anything, it clearly shows that Lymvatinib might have that power, even though it is still within the same defined racetrack, which is the 13 months in survival. What is the power of Lymvatinib? If anything, an improvement of PFS, impressively 7.4 months compared to Lymph the Sorafinib 3.7, almost three, close to three times higher. And also, of course, an improvement in response rate, which actually passed on to about 41% by resist one point, by modified resist, and for about 26% by resist 1.1. So where does this leave us with, if you recall, uh, you know, at least a few years ago, we we're all talking about nivolumab and all excited about a NTPD1 as being the potential new standard of care for sorafenib. This is actually from the uh, Checkmate 040, a study that we are all very familiar with and we are very much involved in. And it showed, after all, that uh, the, a certain duration of response is definitely there for nivolumab, despite the response rate remaining about 15 20%. And that's why I showed the numbers of the lymphatinib a second ago. Nonetheless, this was approved by the FDA specifically for that duration of response, which was rather impressive, even though afterwards the Checkmate 459 comparing the Nivolumab versus Sorafenib in first-line setting was negative. I know and we hear about maybe statistically it was negative, but clinically positive. I call this negative. This did not work. And interestingly, a few years ago, if we were to even dare saying what if, we'll be questioned on that. But ultimately, it showed that the checkpoint inhibitors by themselves are not enough to get or pull an increased or improvement in survival. Of note, the same thing happened with pembrolizumab. Again, as you can see here, duration of response is definitely there. And if anything, however, the comparison to a placebo in second line setting was again negative. The drug is available in second line based on the uh, data that I showed from the phase two, but the phase three trial was negative again. To take us back to the tyrosine kinase inhibitors, that really seems to kind of, you know, continuously uh, showing the positive outcome, rigorafenib in conditional uh, uh, prior sorafenib exposure, uh, gut in approved survival versus placebo, as we can see over here, and this is available to all of us. Cabozantinib, again, versus placebo in second and third line after sorafenib as being the only default therapy available at this point in time, again, was positive. Even though I would say you can, of course, use it regardless of what you take first. And interestingly, the cabozantinib, even in patients who are child POB, has shown a certain improvement in outcome, as you can see over here. Maybe not necessarily to the same magnitude, but nonetheless, it's still there. And I please again here show you, you see that I'm illustrating the different variables that we thought about as being the subgroup analysis based uh, evaluation that we might do, like for example, age, child Q scoring. I'll come to that discussion a little bit later on. But before that, Ramisirumab and TVGF, again, versus placebo showed improved survival in that study, however, that was specifically limited to patients with the baseline alpha feto protein more than 400. I know, and we might look at this in different perspective, the survival was not in the same robust outcome as it was for the other tyrosine kinase inhibitors. Here, only 8.5 months for the ramsurumab versus 7.3 for the placebo. And if you recall, this was kind of brought up from the perspective, is it really a prognostic? Is it a diagnostic? We are not sure. Nonetheless, in that setting, at least we can take it at face value and have this drug available as needed. I go back to the uh, checkpoint inhibitors. And uh, this is a very important model that we all are dependent on because after all, this is where the NTPD1, NTPD1 activity happen at the cell membrane level, which we can see in point number seven on the uh, cycle. 
And then, of course, you can see the NTM VGF, which is like around point number five. And this is really where the Unbrave 150 kind of, you know, bring in their uh, combination effect together. And it's not the only one, though. At one step up, up in the uh, sequence of events from the lymph node to the cell membrane level, lymphatinib as an NTFGF plus pembrolizumab SPD1 also showed us some impressive data, including some CRs. How would we explain that? Actually, if anything, it appears to be that the NTFGF, exemplified here by ardefitinib, in combination with NTPD1, can, of course, kill cells, i.e. K67 will go down and increase immune activity, increase CD3. And that's probably what could have translated into that improvement in survival, despite, of course, the limited data for the Levantin plus pembrolizumab in this phase one, phase two uh, study, which is at 22 months. Of course, we're waiting for the LEAP002 study that will give us a better delineation about this important combination. This brings in a very important concept, and that's really where I illustrated all those examples to come to the important point. After all, as we all know, degeneracy come into play because the further down into the chain of command, there is a potential for certain degeneracy or different pathways to be taken to kind of you know, bypass a certain blockade. And that's where NTVGF come into play, one step above is NTFGF, but of course, way up on the top of the chain of command is the NTCTLA4. And this is exemplified, if anything, by this important uh, description where CD28 talk to CD18 and 86, kind of invite them to a very uh, robust drink, like uh, some solid coffee that energize them and let them pass the message all the way to the cell membrane level. CTLA4 come into play and convince CD80 and the CD86 to drink with them probably some alcohol that make them fall asleep and they can't cause their effect anymore. And this, if anything, this is where NTCTLA4 come into play, take away CTLA4 and let CD86 do their job as it should be. By the way, this is a good uh, exemplified, a simplistic way, at least for me, to uh, explain to others the uh, Nobel Prize that uh, Jim Allison received last year collectively with his colleague from Japan. And this combination, by the way, is already into play. We know very well about nivolumab plus ipilimumab, which is exemplified over here with the improvement in outcome. And enough, this is that already approved by the FDA as a combination in the second line. And interestingly, again, to go back to the same story as I'm bringing examples of potential kind of, you know, uh, subgroup potential analyses, we can see here that independent where the patients are from. We spoke about age, we spoke about the liver uh, functionality, and now we'll talk about the ethnicity. And we can see that, again, it did not matter. And by the way, this combination has been looked into different drugs, Dervalumab plus Tremelumab, which, if anything, it showed that one dose only of the Tremelumab, 300 gram, is enough to kind of enhance that effect with the survival rate for up to 219 months. Not only that, but durable response is very evident as well. We can see here in the delineation in the left upper corner, the T300 plus T with the robust answer in regard to uh, some partial responses and duration of response. Which, of course, will await for the Himalaya study looking into the Dervalumab plus Trebilumab versus Surafnib, and uh, we're waiting until we see the results of that clinical trial. But what happened there? If anything, the story is such. This is data from almost 20 years ago. Snorrithar Garrison at the NCI at that time, if anything, helped us delineate that HCC will depend on different variables, among which the etiology. I spoke about others, but here we'll talk about the etiology. And he clearly said that, in other words, the disease is not the same. If you talk about hepatitis B patient, maybe they have HCC, but it's merely driven by telomere shortening. You take hepatitis C patient, the HCC is probably driven by the EG4-RAF pathway, i.e. maybe something like sorafenib might work. Alcohol, maybe DNA methylation, morbid obesity and NASH, maybe EGFR, P53, et cetera, et cetera. Well, that perspective 
proved not to be working because as we all know, the different tyrosine kinase inhibitors and different change point inhibitors were giving them to all patients independent of the etiology or ethnicity. Interestingly though, we have seen in certain examples, and this is one of them, that for example, patients who have the cells that are enhanced with T cell activation CD3+, CD8+, key 67+, are then that will fare most from the combination. This is an example for the Dervelumab plus Tremelumab, and we can see that the canons of CD4 low and CD8 high, which is exemplified by the purple color T300 plus D. And if you look to the right, you'll see that these are the patients that really benefit the most from the combination of the Tremelumab plus Dervelumab, the T300 plus D, and if anything, it really showed the benefit regardless of what combination, regardless of the single agent, but always showed faithfully for the patient have CD3, CD8, K67 plus T cells. What does that mean? If anything, there are some other regulators coming to play, and this is like novel data that's coming out as we speak. This is rather very new data from nature, that if anything, it shows here the FOXP3 as an important regulator in regard to all the activation of the immune cells activation with, as you can see here, some negative regulators. The latest addition to those are actually the uh, ring figure protein 20. You can see it next to number four on the, X, uh, on the y-axis. And the ubiquitin specific peptide DS22, which is on the uh, positive regulator side, which you can see on top of the screen. These regulators are yet to be understood further, not only those, but also we have also the myeloid response score. And the myeloid response score, as we can see over here, can really range the cells from being very immunocompetent all the way to immunosuppr uh, immunosuppressive. And if anything, this is driven at least in that example by the CD169 activation and CD8 activation. And of course, you come into play here the PD-1 and PDL one as well. These are only to illustrate the point that after all, maybe a better read on the story is not that table that we have seen that was developed based on the data from Snow Rither Garrison, but rather it's a broader perspective that looks more like a star looking at CD4, CD8, FOXP3, myeloid cells, CTLA4, K67, PD-1, PDL one and literally as of just this week, also we brought up hepatitis C and hepatitis B as important variables too. Until that day, and we will wait until this data comes out, we will be dependent on further development. And among which I'll only give it as a uh, introduction to CAR T cells as potential future for the therapy. I think this is really where the money is gonna go ultimately. And until that point in time, we can say that combination therapies are no doubt novel. Totally agree, they are positive. I think we showed quite a bit of that, but remain disruptive. And the Combinations that at least we have for now are the anti VGF plus checkpoint inhibitors, TKIs plus checkpoint inhibitors, and the dual checkpoint inhibitors. Alterations of approaches, including overcome inhibition and sequencing, are ongoing, and this is an important variable we didn't talk much about. But nonetheless, the most important is the upcoming efforts will focus on as really evaluating and knowing in advance who are the respondents and non responders based on this map that I showed you. And of course, the CAR T, let's stay tuned. I invite you to definitely look into more details of this at the uh, Hepatocell Carcinoma Tumor Immune Microenvironment uh, Single Topic Conference that's coming up on December 4 and 5. Uh, this is a Apple uh, uh, new uh, event uh, that we are very proud to pre-host from uh, Memorial Sloan Kettering along with the University of Hawaii. And uh, it will be all about tumor immune microenvironment. And we are honored to welcome actually uh, one of the experts in the field, Judd Walshock, who's gonna teach us all about the tumor immune microenvironment from the world melanoma and how can we apply it for HCC. I'll stop here. Thank you very much.